Internet service providers were not willy-nilly blocking mm -hmm. traffic and throttling traffic. To the contrary, these were all phantoms that were conjured up by people who wanted the FCC for political reasons uh, to overregulate the internet. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason, and today we are talking with Ajit Pai. He's the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, which oversees the licensing of radio and television stations, creates ownership rules for certain types of media companies, polices broadcast radio and television for indecency, and over the past few years has tried to enforce controversial rules that will maintain a free and open internet, sometimes called net neutrality. Ajit, thanks for talking to us. And Nick, great to be with you again. You are repealing Title II rules. Explain what that will do and what you hope to accomplish with that. Well, as you pointed out, Title II involves the panoply of heavy-handed economic regulations that were developed in the Great Depression to handle Ma Bell, the telephone monopoly of the 1930s. Uh, my previous uh, colleagues imposed those rules on the internet, one of the most dynamic uh, systems we've ever known. And uh, earlier, I proposed to my fellow commissioners at the FCC uh, to repeal those Title II regulations. And so going forward, my hope is that in a more free market, light touch environment, we can figure out what the right regulatory framework is to preserve those core protections of a free and open internet that, that existed prior to 2015 when on a party line vote, uh, the FCC adopted these uh, net neutrality so regulations. To get into it a little bit, the um, you know there was a free and open internet in 2015. There's kind of one now too, or it's, you know, nothing much has changed. What was the pressing cause that people said, you know, the internet is being shut down, it's being taken over, it's being warped in ways for, you know, particular business or political interests. What was the proximate cause for pushing a, for this new type of regulation, which was much bigger and much broader than anything before? There was none. Uh, we were not living in a digital dystopia in the years living up to 20, leading up to 2015. Uh, by contrast, actually, the commercialization of the internet in the 1990s up to 2015 uh, it represented, I think, the one of the most uh, incredible free market innovations in history. With light touch regulation, broadband providers spent $1.5 trillion on infrastructure. Companies like Google and Facebook and Netflix became household names precisely because we didn't have the government micromanaging how the internet would operate. And that Clinton era framework is something that I think served us well. And going forward, I hope it continues to serve us well. So what what is something, pulling back Title II, what is something that an ISP or an internet a company can do that they wouldn't be able to do as easily under Title II? Well, nothing in my view, because uh, if you look at the record that the FCC had on the books in 2015, internet service providers were not willy-nilly blocking traffic mm -hmm. and throttling traffic. To the contrary, these were all phantoms that were conjured up by people who wanted the FCC for political reasons uh, to overregulate the internet. And so going forward, if we go back to the uh, rules as they were previously, we are not going to see this parade of horribles that uh, we are sure to hear about in the next coming weeks. And with Title II, I mean, under, or under the open internet order, it was also partly, it was going to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, right? As opposed to saying, here is exactly what you have to comply with as an ISP or as, a, as an internet uh, entity, um, which throws in, I, uh, for me, when I was reading this, I was kind of worried about that because isn't the idea of a rule of law is that you set standard playing rules for everybody and then let people innovate as opposed to saying, I mean, it seems to me that it was almost setting something up with Uber. It's like, oh, well, Uber, I'm a city. I don't like what you're doing to my taxi cab company, so I'm going to go hammer you, even though they're not technically breaking any laws. This was one of the most pernicious features from an administrative perspective of the Title II order. One was the preemptive declaration that every single internet service provider from the big ones down to Main Street Broadband, which is an ISP in Cannon Falls, Minnesota with four customers, all of you are anti-competitive monopolists per se, and we're going to regulate you as such. The other piece of it was, as you put it, that general conduct standard where the agency said, well, in case we didn't overregulate you enough, on a case-by-case -case basis, we're going to think about any particular business practice that uh, you might seem uh, inauspicious to us, and we're going to declare whether or not it's going to be permissive, uh, permitted. And I think what you saw was the agency then sticking its uh, toes into the water with respect to free data. Should we prohibit mm -hmm. cell phone companies from offering consumers data for free, exempt from data caps? Well, and, and let's talk about that because this was always the example. You know, I mean, when people talk about net neutrality or an open internet, you, you conjure up the idea of, uh, you know, I, I have Time Warner, which is now Spectrum, I guess, and, uh, and I, I want to go to Reason.com on Spectrum, and it's blocked, or I can't get there, or it won't load, and it's because the people there 
don't like reason, they don't like our politics, or maybe our competitors have bought some kind of thing to kind of block us. That's, that's what people worry about. That kind of stuff is not happening. It does not happen, no. Yeah. So then what is the, uh, you know, what are the other fears of, uh, you know, of, of, of like a blocked internet? Well, I think some of what uh, the advocates of uh, these uh, Title II regulations are interested in is prohibiting uh, any company, any internet service provider, from offering consumers mm -hmm. uh, data in a way that they think is somehow right. anti-competitive. And this comes down to things like T-Mobile, Verizon exactly. has a version of these zero-rated plans where if you're, if you're listening on your phone through your server or service, say it's T-Mobile, and you, listen, you can listen to whatever you want on Spotify, and it doesn't count against your monthly data cap. Right. And that that's a bad thing. Exactly. And if you look at the hysteria surrounding T-Mobile's binge on and music freedom offerings, I mean, this is simply allowing consumers to consume all kinds of video from a variety of providers or music from a variety of providers exempt from those data limits. Anyone who meets, meets T-Mobile's technical specifications can be a part of the program. And yet even that pro-competitive, pro-consumer offering was seen as a grave violation of net neutrality. And I think it just betrays the fact that these are people who want regulation for the sake of regulation, not to yeah. benefit consumers. Uh, can you dilate a little bit on that? Because I mean, net neutrality is only, as a concept, is only, what, about 10, 15 years old. I mean, it, it appeared in a, in a law article, I think, in 2005, right. uh, a law review article. But, you know, how, I mean, what do people say when, you, when you're, you're saying, look, T-Mobile is going to let you, you know, listen to as much music as you want from any service that signs up for that. And if your preferred service isn't on that, then the, the data you save by listening to Spotify or Pandora or something, you can use that data for your own service that you want. Where, like, do they advance arguments that that is somehow harming the, the public interest? They claim that it is harming the public interest by disadvantaging uh, music providers or video providers who can't be a part of that system. Yeah. But that simply hasn't proven to be the case. And I think it, it drives more from an impulse to want to regulate uh, the internet at all costs and de deem every single internet service provider uh, you know, per se evil and anti-competitive. Right. And, that's just and it's, it's almost as if with, with pushing Title II on people, you're trying to get back to the idea that, of course, everybody hated the phone company. Lily Tomlin, the comedian, built right. her career by being a nasty telephone operator, who, uh, a customer service rep who was completely unresponsive and her tagline was, we're from the phone company and we don't have to do anything, you know, right. so, and she would uh, give people raspberries over the phone. But, but the funny thing about that is it's precisely because the phone company was a slow moving monopolist that, that, that yeah. that's exactly the point we're trying to make. These rules, Title II rules, were designed to regulate Ma Bell. And the promise with Ma Bell, the right. deal with the government was, we'll give you a monopoly in, as long as you give universal service to the country. And as a result, for decades, we didn't see innovation in the network, we didn't see innovation in phones. And it's when you have a competitive marketplace and you let go right. of that impulse to regulate everything preemptively, that you finally get to see a more of a competitive environment. Yeah, this is also something that I suspect a lot of people uh, kind of don't understand or take for granted of, you know, the phone that you were using in 1950 and 1980 was basically the same. Right. We're not even using the same phones we were using 10 years ago. I mean, it's fully different technology, wide range of services and whatnot. Oh, and it's incredible when you yeah. think about it. I mean, 20 years ago, we were talking about AOL sending CD-ROMs in the mail, uh, you know, 56K modems. Right. I mean, to go from that to a discussion about how do we incentivize the deployment of gigabit fiber in inner city Detroit, I mean, this is, uh, we've come leaps and bounds, and it hasn't been because of preemptive regulation in, from the 1930s. Yeah. It's because of that entrepreneurial spirit. Well, your appointment and certainly the Title II announcement is, is makes it only more controversial. You've already been very controversial in, uh, in an administration that has ha had a lot of controversy. Um, Gizmodo recently ran an article titled Everything Ajit Pai Has Fucked Up in the Last Three Months. <laughs> and that was, that was kind of on the soft side of the headlines. <laughs> but critics, critics seem to be especially worried that you're overly friendly or you will be to business interests. What is your general philosophy? Because you're, you're not an anarchist. You're not, you're not going in to blow up the FCC. Right. What's your general philosophy about the role the FCC should be playing in the 21st century? Well, I take the very radical right-wing uh, position that the Clinton administration basically got it right when it came to digital infrastructure, that uh, you want to take a light-touch approach. And look, regulators can take one of two basic uh, philosophies. 
You can preemptively regulate and say, we anticipate there are going to be major market failures everywhere, so why even bother taking a look at what the marketplace facts are? Let's just regulate it as if it's all going to be in a competitive monopoly. The other perspective is, let things develop organically, and if you see any competitive conduct from a company or companies, then you take targeted action to address that problem. I am firmly in the second camp because there are serious and unintended consequences, some cases they're intended, I guess, yeah. but uh, to preemptive regulation. And we're seeing some of that now with investment decreasing, with innovation in terms of business plans uh, decreasing. And you know, mother may I is not the right way you want to incentivize digital companies uh, in this uh, economy. There have been recent actions to allow ISPs to collect, use, and sell data from users the same way that companies such as Google and Facebook already do or have been doing for a while. You support that move. A lot of privacy advocates don't. What, what are they missing in your analysis? My position is pretty simple. Whenever consumers go online, they have a uniform expectation of privacy. That means that they expect whatever company is handling their sense of information, whether it's a so-called edge provider or content provider or their internet service provider, to handle that information information with care. And prior to 2015, the Federal Trade Commission applied a uniform system of regulations to anyone in the internet economy who handled that information. Uh, with Title II, the FCC stripped the FTC of jurisdiction right. and, uh, for privacy. And all I'm simply saying is we need to return to that consistent and comprehensive framework. Consumers deserve to have to be protected regardless of the company that holds their information. And, and the idea is also that one, one assumes that if uh, the ISP is, is selling the data, some of the benefits will come back to the users, right, uh, on some level. That's one of the ways the internet has developed, is that for non-sensitive information, consumers generally have understood that there is more of an opt-out uh, approach where uh, in exchange for uh, the, the sharing of that information, they get lower prices or better services and the like. And that's simply how the internet has worked and in the last couple of years. With the, with the abandonment of Title II, then the FTC does have jurisdiction to kind of regulate these types of practices. That's correct. If yeah. we did repeal Title II, then uh, we would take away that what's called a common mm -hmm. carrier classification for internet service providers. And uh, then the Federal Trade Commission ultimately uh, we anticipate would be able to regulate. You have, you have talked about uh, using the FTC rather than the FCC to kind of adjudicate various other claims in terms of uh, kind of concentration of, uh, of, of ISP ownership and things like that. Why are you looking, I, I mean, it's an odd thing for a, a, a newly minted chairman of, a, of an agency to say, you know what, I, I want some other agency to do this work for me. What's going on there? Well, what's going on is simply that we have a competition authority on the beat. We have a consumer protection uh, authority with expertise, uh, and that is the Federal Trade Commission. And they have long jurisdiction uh, over both the uh, antitrust side of the equation and the consumer protection in terms of privacy side of the equation. And uh, by stripping them of that authority two years ago, uh, the FCC didn't automatically grant itself that expertise right. or that longstanding um, a set of precedents. We simply are started making it up on our own. And I think you saw the results for themselves, that the privacy regulations that the FCC conjured up were, number one, completely asymmetric, and number two, ignored the way the internet works in terms of encrypted traffic and the like. And so um, I would rather return that to the agency with uh, expertise in these issues and uh, that's, I think, better for consumers, Do you too. worry? I mentioned I, uh, I was part of uh, Time Warner. It's now Spectrum. There have been a number of major mergers among uh, ISPs. Right. Um, does, at what point, how do you adjudicate that to say, you know what, there's too much market concentration here? Or is it that it's not the amount of, um, it's not the concentration of a particular ISP, but rather the, what, what are the other factors that would go into, say, um, you know, this is a competitive marketplace, even if there are only two or three companies in it. Well, there are two different approaches that I take. So first, with respect to any transaction that's presented to us, uh, we apply at the FCC the public interest standard. And so we have to determine, would the consummation of this transaction uh, be good for consumers and for competition? Uh, if it is, then we approve it. If it's not, then we uh, see, okay, are there are conditions that are narrowly tailored that could help us uh, make it in the public interest. And if there aren't, then we simply disapprove it. The second major piece in the puzzle, and something I've been very active on, and something which notably uh, the press has ignored, has been uh, getting more competition in the, into the marketplace, Re revising and removing regulatory barriers to infrastructure investment. 
Ultimately, the best way to solve the problem surrounding net neutrality or any of these other ish consumer protection issues is to get more companies from using a variety of technologies to deploy infrastructure everywhere in the United right. States. And from my perspective, I could care less whether it's a cable company, a telephone company, a wireless company, a satellite company, or an upstart, uh, yeah. like Google and Facebook and whatnot, who are experimenting. Talk about I want them all to, to compete. Talk about some, when you talk about, you know, it's regulatory barriers, but it's also physical ones. I mean, because you're talking about the ability to actually string wires or cable or, or um, transmission towers. Uh, get, get into the weeds a little bit, because one of the, I think one of the things that is difficult about a, a lot of uh, digital uh, policy is that we just take it for granted, and it's magic. It just you oh. flip a switch, it turns on, but it's built on real stuff. Building a broadband network is really hard, and I've seen it for myself. When you're trenching fiber and you have to dig up a road, or when you're trying to attach equipment to utility poles, or when you're trying to site a gateway earth station for a satellite uh, uh, pro a broadband company, it's really hard work. It's expensive. It's difficult to find people to do it. And in some cases, there are significant regulatory barriers. Uh, for example, one of the biggest cost elements to building a broadband network is to get access to utility poles in a timely way and in a cheap way. And so I was visiting with Rocket Fiber, for instance, a startup ISP in Detroit, which mm -hmm. had issues with the city of Detroit getting uh, cost-effective access and timely access to the utility poles. In some cases, the city was asking for rates that were simply prohibitive. And mm -hmm. if you can't uh, afford those, uh, those pole attachments, as they're called, you're never going to build the network. And so that's one of the things we've identified actively I've set up a broadband deployment advisory committee, which we met just last week for the first time, to identify things like that, you know, pole attachment problems, uh, you know, problems getting access to uh, a conduit that lays in the ground and the like. Those are the nitty gritty things that the FCC has the power to do and would ultimately benefit consumers in terms of competitive choice. But unfortunately, more sexy, high profile issues like uh, Title II seem to occupy all the oxygen. Um, well, let's talk about sexy issues, uh, indecency fines yeah. and whatnot. The FCC is in charge of, you know, and it's, what is the, you know, I, I say this as somebody, everything I watch is either comes over a computer screen or it's cable and then pops up on a, on a TV. So I don't, I don't know the last time I actually watched a, an over the air broadcast. Um, but uh, the FCC lo uh, uh, levies fines on indecency. Um, when are we going to stop doing that? When I mean, isn't that just insane at this point to even have a category of uh, law, which is kind of vague anyway, to say this is indecent because it was broadcast over the air on a TV that maybe nobody's watching anymore, um, but we're going to we're going to make sure that some station pays hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, potentially for airing a fleeting ob obscenity. That's ultimately a decision that Congress uh, has to make with the guidance of the Supreme Court. Uh, so long as uh, Section 1464, which is the law in the books mm -hmm. that requires us to prohibit obscene, uh, indecent, and profane content over the airwaves, so long as that remains. So in other words, HBO will never be able to be broadcast. It'll <laughs> always be cable only. <laughs> right, yeah, Game of yeah. Thrones, I suspect, yeah. will not be seen uh, yeah. in reruns on a broadcast right. network anytime soon. But So we, we are duty-bound at the FCC yeah. to administer it as best we can within the confines of the uh, constitutional uh, uh, decisions of the uh, Supreme Court. And so we're uh, obviously, I'm just a couple of months on the job, so we're trying to figure out the right way forward. But uh, this, this is one of the concerns. Is I've that heard something often. that you can kind of uh, minimize or, or can you make it, can you deprioritize it or say, you know, now we're going after all the, all the smut peddlers on, uh, you know, on ABC? Well, as a practical matter, the agency has limited resources, so we can't go after every single case and every single area under our jurisdiction. But if there's a targeted case that uh, uh, merits- would you, uh, have, uh, would you have kept pushing on the uh, Janet Jackson Nipplegate case? That's a good question. It's been a long time uh, since that case happened before I got there. And so uh, I think in some cases that litigation has gone for many, many years. And, yeah. Uh, uh, it just, and the uh, Bono and uh, what the Nicole Bono Ritchie, and Cher, um, yeah. Now these are like, right. You know, it, where the government isn't in enough debt, so we we could always wait for these cases, <laughs> right? To keep um, in con in congressional testimony in March, you were asked whether you agreed with Donald Trump that the press is the enemy of the people. You replied in part, "I believe that every American enjoys the First Amendment protections guaranteed by the Constitution." That response angered activists. Um, why do you think it angered them? Well, I think one reason it angered them is because they are going to oppose anything I say or do. Mm -hmm. If I say that the sky is blue, they will complain that uh, Pi rejects the diversity of colors in the sky and denies the existence of clouds. Uh, but another piece of it, I think, is that there is a very a strong political debate in this country about the role of the news media. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. Uh, there's a debate about fake news in particular. 
I don't want to get into that political mm-hmm. debate because that's frankly above my pay grade as an agency head. What I do believe in, however, is that under the First Amendment, journalists do an important job in informing their local communities about news and other issues of the day. And I've spoken consistently about uh, the importance of First Amendment freedoms and the freedom of the press. So I'm, I'm getting the sense that you don't believe in the First Amendment whatsoever. That, I mean, this is what I'm hearing. But Well, the other curious thing about it is the same people who are criticizing me for that have nary a word to say about the lack of free speech on college campuses, mm-hmm. uh, the, the censoring of uh, freedom of the speech on the over the uh, Internet in foreign countries. And that's, you know, I think you have to be consistent when it comes to the, this I issue. actually, what I particularly liked about your uh, answer, and I say this as a journalist, that you said every American enjoys First Amendment protections because... The minute that we only start giving them to so-called journalists, then we're picking, you know, the, the press is being licensed by the government. So. Oh, absolutely. And then it becomes animal farm. You know, yeah. all, all journalists are equal, but some are more equal than yeah. others. And then uh, the government shouldn't be in the business of figuring out who that um, is. Do you worry, though, at all about the president's statements? Uh, you know, back when he was running, he talked about loosening up libel laws so he could sue the New York Times. He's made a lot of statements along that uh, line to Jeff Bezos, who's both the uh, owner of Amazon, but the owner of the Washington Post as well. Does that kind of talk uh, frighten you at all? Well, I think that you know the president uh, has made a number of statements uh, that uh, reflect uh, what he considers to be uh, his view of the, the news media yeah. and how they have covered him. And uh, obviously the news media has been critical of him. He's been critical of them. That's sort of the classic First Amendment debate. Uh, right. You can introduce an idea, and if people don't like it, they can say they don't, and a number of people have. And so, do you interact much with uh, President Trump? And uh, what what is the what's the nature of that kind of communication? I've met him several times. I interviewed with him when he was president elect in uh, January. Did and, you go up uh, to Trump Tower? I did. Yes. And did you get the Taco Bowl? I did. <laughs> I did not get the Taco Bowl, but I do remember walking into. Uh, on the way into his office, you walk in this hallway and I all of a sudden had a feeling. I thought, wow, I've been here before. I've seen it. I realized that is the hallway where the Apprentice oh, contestants yeah. go after they've been uh, fired. So, oh, really? Oh, so fortunately, it ended a up a little of, better yeah, a for me. A lot of sad but, people uh, uh, giving right. a, a three-minute summation of right. why they got fired. But. Exactly. But the second time yeah. I met him was at the White House. So what what uh, has he articulated any kind of broad uh, vision for what he wants you to be doing at the FCC? Generally speaking, he said, uh, keep doing what you're doing in terms of prioritizing infrastructure investment and making sure that we get this part of the economy moving again. Uh, It's one sixth of the the national economy. And uh, we think that uh, I'm glad that he agrees that Mm -hmm. uh, rules of the road that are light touch, that incentivize investment and innovation are ultimately better for everybody uh, in this country. Is, you know, he obviously one of the things from I mean, you know, he's a man of many moods and of many contradictions, but he's generally pro-deregulation and, uh, like you're saying, light touch. He also has a touch of cronyism in him or or playing, uh, you know, playing with local and state governments to get certain types of inducements, which is something that the cable industry certainly historically has done. Do you feel like um, there is a way uh, forward that will minimize the, the kind of historical baggage of cable operators being so indebted to local governments for monopoly contracts. You know, can we get out of that finally into a world of internet connectivity and I guess all media connectivity that is finally a true, more of, more of an open playing field? Absolutely, and this is one of the things I prioritized during my time at the commission, just uh, making sure that we have objective, uh, upfront rules of the road that prevent anybody from gaming the system. I mean, arbitrage, I think, is just poison to those of us who believe firmly in the power of a free market. And so several years ago, for instance, I led the charge against uh, a one Fortune 500 company gaming our small business program to get $3.3 billion in taxpayer credits. What company was that? Uh, it was a Dish Corporation. Okay. Uh, was uh, in participating in the Spectrum auction using uh, small businesses as essentially shells uh, for, to bid in the auction because those uh, shells got uh, bidding credits. Right. Uh, similarly, I've consistently said that I want there to be statewide franchising uh, for internet service providers and video com- providers and the like so that companies don't have to go jurisdiction by jurisdiction and essentially dole out goodies as the price of getting a monopoly license to serve that particular area. I mean, that's the worst of all worlds for consumers because then you don't get competitive choice and you're paying out uh, in uh, terms of a t- you know, greater taxes. What about, like. uh, you know, one of the things that you've been criticized for is saying that uh, the FCC doesn't have the right to cap uh, the rates that prisons charge prisoners. Uh, talk about that a little bit because, you know, from the outside on some level, you know, you're in prison, you're, you know, and you're getting ripped off by the phone company. Right. Uh, where were you? I mean, where is your thinking on all that? This is one of the most misunderstood issues. So there are two possibilities when it comes to a phone call made uh, from a prisoner. One 
is that it is a phone call that uh, is entirely within one state, and one is a phone call that uh, crosses state boundaries, interstate. Now, with respect to intrastate uh, phone calls, the law of the Communications Act is crystal clear. The FCC doesn't have jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. In any of the areas we regulate, we simply don't have intrastate jurisdiction over rates. Pretty clear. So there, it's just a legal dispute. With respect to interstate rates, I put a plan on the table several years ago that would have lowered rates dramatically in prisons and jails across this country and was based on the evidence that was in the record. And unfortunately, my colleagues disagreed with me. And what's notable is the D.C. Circuit, the Court of Appeals here in Washington, uh, stayed my colleague's decision four separate times. Hmm. And that tells you something. When the Court of Appeals here is saying, we don't think the evidence in the record is sufficient to justify the rates that the FCC ultimately picked, that seems to be a signal that you know, we should have done something different. And that something different, I believe, was my proposal. If we had adopted it four years ago, these rates would have been lower for prisoners everywhere in the country right now. Do you think prisoners should pay rates based on the severity of their crimes? Absolutely not. No, no. I'm joking. <laughs> No, consumer is uh, yeah. a consumer, and yeah. uh, you know, people who are incarcerated deserve to have as much of a functioning marketplace as anybody else. And I've consistently said that this is not a normal marketplace. Right. They don't yeah. have choice, yeah. and that's why yeah, I've put on the. I mean, it's unusual for someone who believes in free markets right. as I do to put on the table a, a prescriptive rate regulation system. That's exactly what I did because I recognize that prisoners don't have it. The what way about we do. Um, universal service? It came up uh, uh, previously in our conversation. Uh, all of the early kind of utility models and and certainly for phone service and telecommunications it's all and 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 for the post office for that matter based on this idea of universal service there are certain elements or, or ideas that you've talked about where you seem to be pulling away from that or it doesn't seem to have the same purchase that it once did what you know is universal service um is should it should it be something that needs to be rethought well, I firmly believe in the promise of universal service. I grew up in a part of rural Kansas that is all too often on the wrong side of uh, the uh, digital divide. And so I've made it a priority of the FCC to make sure that anybody in this country who wants internet access mm -hmm. in particular should be able to get it. And every one of my actions that I've taken has been oriented around that, the creating this broadband deployment advisory committee, uh, streamlining the rules for wireless and wireline infrastructure, which we just did last week, making sure that we uh, promote 4G LTE in all parts of this country so you don't have massive dead spots. Uh, I mean, these are all geared toward making sure that whether you live in uh, Ottawa, Kansas, or in Washington, D.C., you have connectivity if you want to take advantage of it. Um, well, uh, let's talk a, a bit about your uh, last fall. You released a digital empowerment agenda that yeah. outlined four main areas of action, gigabit opportunity zones, right. mobile broadband for rural America, removing regulatory boundaries to broadband rollout, and uh, promote entre entrepreneurship and innovation. Is that kind of the framework for your chairmanship? Absolutely. I outlined it in yeah. September of last year precisely because I did not want the fate of it to de be decided based on what party happened to control right. the FCC in January. Can we, can, let's, uh, let's run through these real quick sure. and get a sense. So the gigabit opportunity zones, I think you mentioned something about Detroit. Is that one of, is that what you're talking about? Well, so the idea here was we could take a geographic area. It could be as small as an inner city block or as large as a rural county. And so long as 70, uh, the income of the people in that area was 75% or less of the national median, then we would extend tax incentives to internet service providers to build out broadband in those mm -hmm. areas. We would additionally uh, relieve the payroll side taxes for employers who want to build businesses in those areas. And that was, the thought there was this is a way to build on Secretary Jack Kemp's idea for empowerment zones in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, you create the digital opportunity in these areas so that we don't leave talent simply withering on the vine. Do you, are, are they in place anywhere and do you have good evidence of that? Because I, I know with Kemp's empowerment zones, it turned out a lot of the economic analysis showed that they really didn't do very much. Right, so uh, it hasn't, it's not in place now because yep. Congress has to authorize it. And so we're working with members of Congress and the administration uh, to, to incorporate it into a part of an infrastructure bill. Do, and do you think is uh, kind of uh, super high speed bandwidth or uh, broadband, is that a type of thing where if you build it, they will come? I think it is, I and mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a gigabit. I mean, yeah. it's designed right. to scale up to a gigabit, but I do believe that there's entrepreneurship out there. I mean, just a few weeks ago, I was in Youngstown, Detroit, and Cleveland, and uh, 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 Pittsburgh, and I got to see these entrepreneurs who are building digital companies in areas that would have been you would have never thought of as being havens for entrepreneurship. Well, yeah, let's. I mean, part uh, one of your uh, points is also to promote entrepreneurship and innovation. Yeah. So, what what kinds of stuff are they doing there? What is capable? 
what is possible when you have really good uh, broadband deployment? Oh, just to give you one example, uh, when I was in Cincinnati outlining uh, this uh, idea about a digital empowerment agenda, I, I visited a company called Chore Monster, and uh, they what they essentially do is create an online application that allows parents to interact with their kids and get their kids to do chores in a really fun way. And mm -hmm. uh, so it's something that I personally take interest in since yeah. I have young kids. Uh, but that company explicitly told me that they set up shop in the over the Rhine neighborhood of Cincinnati mm -hmm. because they had Cincinnati Bell's gigabit service to uh, their facility. And that was critical for them because they need to do you know, very high bandwidth uh, intensive analytics and the like. And uh, that's one of the things we see all over yeah, the place. And over the Rhine is, uh, you know, always considered one of the worst neighborhoods in the country, not just Cincinnati. So that, Exactly. And it's coming you know. back for this reason. So uh, what about um, uh, mobile uh, mobile broadband for rural America? What wh How does that play out? You said you grew up in a kind of isolated town in the yeah. middle of Kansas. So uh, how, do, how do you promote that? Uh, a few different ways. Number one is more wisely spending the federal subsidies that the FCC oversees. And we did that this past February. Uh, so right now, we spend billions of dollars every year to try to promote mobile broadband, but it doesn't necessarily go to the uh, rural areas that need it the most. And so uh, on a unanimous vote, which is something that's pretty remarkable in Washington, we got, got across the finish line a revision to our $4.5 billion plan to make sure that that money is spent to, uh, to build out 4G LTE in parts of the country that don't currently have it. Another piece of it involved uh, requiring wireless carriers to build out more fully to the areas that are covered by their licenses. So right now, for example, uh, for certain wireless licenses, you only have to build out to 66% of that geographic territory. Yet you're given an exclusive use of those public airways. And so it seemed to me we should increase that percentage to say 90 or 95% to make sure that the public benefits from that. And then also removing uh, regulatory burdens to broadband rollout. So part of right. that is the stuff like the, telephone, or the utility poles right. and the conduit it's under yeah, streamlining access to utility poles, making dig once uh, the national policy of the land. If you have a federally funded transportation project and you're digging up the road, why not lay the conduit, the pipe uh, in the ground that allows any company, big or small, incumbent or competitor, to have access to that pipe? Different ideas like that that uh, would be uh, simply preserving the public interest and uh, advancing broadband deployment at the same time. I think we agree that all of the bad things that the pro net neutrality forces have said, you know, will happen. You know, they haven't come to pass yet. But after the repeal of Title II, if they do come to pass, will you revisit the decision? I've consistently said that if we see bad behavior in the marketplace, that we will take the action within our authority and we'll work with my partners at the Federal Trade Commission, Department of Justice and elsewhere so that they can take action to make sure that that conduct is addressed. Would that would and would bad conduct would clearly mean something like blocking particular sites. Uh, what about allowing um, fast lanes for certain types of uh, where somebody can pay more to have a quicker uh, deployment of their content. Is that is that good behavior or bad behavior as far as you're concerned? It, it depends on the nature of the arrangement. I mean, you can envision some pro-competitive uh, arrangements like that. For example, if you are a healthcare provider and you are uh, trying to synthesize data quickly with respect to some of the patients who are monitoring remotely, that traffic might be more important to you, you would think, than simply sending an email. Conversely, you can imagine some anti-competitive arrangements as well. So it's a highly fact-intensive inquiry uh, that any regulator would have to examine. As a final question for you, uh, Chairman Pai, how will you know if your tenure uh, is a success? What are, what are the benchmarks for that? I think the benchmarks are going to be uh, whether broadband is more fully deployed throughout the country, uh, whether more Americans are taking advantage of it, uh, whether our digital economy is healthier in a few years than it is today. Uh, those are some of the, uh, the uh, milestones, so to speak, that I'll be looking for. But ultimately, the proof's going to be in the pudding. I have confidence that a market-based, light-touch regulatory approach uh, is going to be beneficial for the American people. And I'm uh, committed to delivering on that agenda in the time to come. All right. Well, we will leave it there. Thanks so much for talking to us. And Nick, it's great to be back with you. We have been talking with Chairman of the FCC, Ajit Pai. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.